Well, good morning to everybody. Are you guys ready to have some fun? My name is Sandy Carter, and I am the COO of Unstoppable Domains and the founder of Unstoppable Women of Web3 and AI. And I have, I think, a great presentation for you with some great takeaways as well. But before we get started, I wanted to tell you a story of something that happened to me yesterday. I was walking down the street in Austin, and there was a bottle on the ground. So I reached down, picked it up. I must have, you know, accidentally rubbed it because out popped a genie. Now this was in the middle of the day, so I hadn't been drinking. And the genie said to me, Sandy, this is your lucky day. Not only do you get to speak to these amazing people at South by Southwest, but you get three wishes. However, there is a catch. There's always a catch, right? And this catch was that whatever I wished for, my evil arch enemy got double. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So the first wish, I wish for a beautiful house with a, on a beach. I love the beach. I got it, poof, but my arch enemy got two. Secondly, I wish for that cyber truck that's been following me around everywhere, that Tesla. I don't know if you guys have seen it. So I wish for one of those. I got it, but poof, my evil arch enemy got two. So for my final wish, I said, Jeannie, would you please scare me half to death? So why do I tell you that today? Well, it's not to scare you half to death. It's because I have three wishes for this presentation. Um, and they are this. When you walk out of the room, one, you want to be an AI first thinker. Number two, you will know that your business will be disrupted and not by one thing, but by many things that we'll talk about today. And number three, stop resisting and start learning. These are the things we're going to go through. Now, let me tell you a couple of stories. We're going to imagine a future that is not too far away. So come with me, please, into this new world. So have you guys ever ordered a pizza, a delivery pizza? I have. But imagine a future, and I've seen a startup that has this in alpha already, a humanoid robot coming to your house to deliver your pizza to you. You pay digitally with crypto, of course. And then what happens is not only do they deliver the pizza, but the humanoid robot comes into your house and serves you the pizza. He sets the table, he pours the drinks, and gets everything ready for you. But wait, you know when the meal's over, there's something that happens that I really don't like is you have to do the dishes. So my humanoid robot is going to select the dish soap and do the dishes for me. What a great idea, right? But now think about implications on your brand. If you're Coke or Pepsi, and now the humanoid robot is pouring the drink, does that mean that you now have to market to the company that sells the robot? Does that mean you need to embed in a large language learning, learning model? What are the implications? If the robot is doing the dishes, does he or she pick that P&G product that's sitting there to do the dishes with? Just some things to start, start thinking about as an AI first leader. But let's do another one, okay, in terms of disruption. Uh, now, this is quite funny. So the day before I came here, I went to have my teeth cleaned. And no joke, this is what they did. The first thing they did is the dentist said, I have a new tool. It is tooth recognition. And as they scanned my mouth, they were recognizing different teeth. And the AI tool set actually helped the dentist identify any issues in my teeth. But guess what? The dentist didn't execute on the, the device. The dental hygienist did. And so I was fascinated. I asked her, did you get trained on this? And she said, yes, I was so interested in it. I went and took two classes on AI because a dental hygienist role is changing so much. Also think about the molds now. Now you don't have to go do molds. So if you're a mold company, now this is being replaced by artificial intelligence tools. And one more will do. And this is also a real startup doing this today. It's a company called 360 Fashion. These are mood jackets. Anybody ever have a mood ring? This is a mood jacket. What does it do? It senses your mood. 
They're being tested today in factories in Asia to determine, do you need a break every 15 minutes? Or do you have a special, I mean, not a break every 15 minutes, a break every hour for 15 minutes? Or do you have a specialized way that you would need a break? Um, it can sense when you're hot, when you're cold, when you're sad. But now think about this, if you're a manager now on the shop floor, do you now need to think about change management? How are you gonna execute this? How do you explain to factory workers that they're now wearing a jacket that's collecting very personal, personal information about you? All of these things are five years away, 10 years away from happening. And so everybody in the room, I hope one message that you take away from the session today is that you need to start resisting and start learning about this technology. Um, anybody know that Waymo is now here? They actually launched here at South by Southwest. Um, I come from Phoenix and Waymo is already there. You can already take a Uber in a Waymo, which is an autonomous car. There's no one driving the car. It takes you from point A to point B by itself. Um, this would be a great thing for you to try. And did you know that if you try it and you ride in an autonomous vehicle three times, your consumer behavior actually changes. The studies show that after three rides in a Waymo Uber, that you're more likely to buy an autonomous vehicle. Also, the price is cheaper too. Okay, so let's go, go to our seven trends, and I'll show you how these relate, because you wanna be an AI thinker. You know your business is gonna be disrupted, and you need to stop resisting and start learning, and here's some of the things that you should learn. So I put them all on one slide real quick so you guys could take a picture. I will show it again at the very end as well, but I'm gonna walk you through each of these seven trends. There's so much to say and tell. I'll try to tell stories so that you really get it as well um, so that you can come with me on this journey. So our very first trend, exponential baby. Everything is growing at an exponential rate. Let me just flash through some trends for you that are not growing at a straight line, not growing linear, but are growing exponentially. So let's first take the, take the world of AI. 80% of enterprises say that in 2024, they will increase their use of Gen AI. 80%, the highest of any technology ever adopted, adopted by enterprises. NVIDIA, you guys have heard about NVIDIA. They're now a trillion dollar company. They do the hardware that's behind all the AI. You can see here that the shipments are going up and look who they're going up to. Microsoft and Meta, Oracle, Amazon. So we can see that this is like a foreshadowing of what's to come because they're buying these chips ahead of time. But wait, it goes on. Productivity is increasing at an incredible pace. Remember, we thought that this might displace blue-collar workers, but look at all the automation that's happening. Automation of 46% in the offices, legal work. But if you look at the circle that I have, 25% increase of automation from artificial intelligence just in one year from Gen AI. But wait, there's more. The path to a million users was exponentially increased with our announcement of chat GPT. So all of these things are happening exponentially as you go, but it's not just AI. Um, last year we talked about crypto, then crypto took a, dry, a dive, but look now at crypto. It is now increasing in value. It's now one of the highest asset classes of value. And the chart on the right, I know it's super hard to, to see, but just look at the top row. In orange is crypto and it ranks it from top to bottom of the top asset class. You can see here, top asset class, crypto is there, increasing exponentially. But now let's talk about data. Data is increasing. In the next 10 years, it's gonna increase by 660 zettabytes. And that was hard for me. Okay, how do I explain a zettabyte? So here's what it is. Every person gets an additional 610 iPhones per person, and that's how much data is gonna increase if you have 128 gig. So all of these things are happening exponentially. Now, why is this a trend? 
Well, you, as a leader, uh, as part of your company, you are absorbing all of these trends that are happening all at one time, exponentially, baby. And so you're sitting right here, and this is getting ready to take off even faster. You're gonna see more faster trends. So for you as a leader, as an employee in a company, even as a person in your own home expecting a humanoid robot to come in and do your dishes, are going to have to deal with all of this acceleration. So your homework here around leadership is, with this exponential impact, you're gonna to have to look at three things. One is change management. Remember back to the factory worker now wearing the jacket. How do you explain that to your employees? You're gonna need empathy as you go through, through this as well. How do you ensure that your employees are with you? They might be worried about their jobs being replaced. And then finally, you're gonna to need to know some about the technology. Just like that dental hygienist said, I went and took two classes on artificial intelligence. Now, she wasn't learning how to code, but this is really helpful as you're going forward as a leader. So this is our trend number one, exponential baby. Everything is increasing exponentially, and I do not expect it to slow down. So now let's go to our second trend that we have, and this is multimodal learning models are now here. So we've been talking about learning models for quite some time, but now we've got these multimodal learning models that are coming into the play. And what does that mean? Well, simply it means that no longer are these learning models just accepting text as data. They're not just scraping the internet. What they're now doing is they're looking at video. They're looking at sound. They're looking at text. They're looking at images that exist out there. Now they're taking multi-modes of data that's happening. And this is really game-changing if you think about it. I think there's about 30 or 40 multimodal systems that I found today at this South by Southwest. I predict by next South by Southwest, there'll be thousands of these out there. Why is it game changing? First of all, you enhance all the learning capabilities because now the machine is actually learning like you do. It has all these senses. You have richer data analytics and deeper insight because now you have more data and also increased accessibility. I don't know if you saw the ad from Google at the Super Bowl where they talked about helping someone who had poor eyesight be able to see for the, for the uh, foreseeable future. So all of these trends to me are really powerful. So let me show you. How many of you guys use ChatGPT today? All of you? Have you, have you tried the multimodal aspects of chat today? Yes, many of you have, some of you haven't. So I just took, this is a Chick-fil-A teacup, of course. So I took a picture of it, and what ChatGPT came back is said, hey, this is a styrofoam cup. Uh, it has a chicken on it. It looks like it's, it's a logo from Chick-fil-A, so it gave me information about my cup. I also did it with a bottle of Hint water. For a marketing perspective, it actually came back and said, zero calories. Here's the things that Hint water has. So now, as a marketeer, one of the other things you have to look at is if people are gonna be taking pictures of your product and then getting descriptions from multimodal learning models, how is your product described? What, is, what does it say about your product? But let's go on to another one. This is the AI agent. I happened to be at CES this year and got to have my hands on the Rabbit One. Um, I ordered one, it's only $199. It is super cool. Let me tell you this way. Um, um, the CEO of Microsoft said that when he saw this demo, for him, it was the same game changer as when he saw Steve Jobs introduce the first iPhone. Now, what does it do? Well, it's basically AI in your hand. It's a piece of hardware, but it has multimodal learning models embedded in it, meaning that it can listen, it can see, it can take text, it can look at your location. So what can I do with it? Well, one example is I can have it in my hand, I can call for an Uber, 
with my voice. It knows my location. It takes a picture of who's with me. So it says, wow, you need an Uber for four people, eight people, one person, whatever you need. It's gonna be game changer. They just took another pre-order, so if you wanna grab one, then I think it'll be really interesting to play with this, along with our stop resisting, start learning as well. But there are more. So there are now robotic lawnmowers. Now you might be saying, hey, I can buy one of those on Amazon today. But you can't buy this one. Because the ones you buy on Amazon, you have to have a metal wire that boxes off where that lawnmower can go. This is actually almost like a Tesla in a lawnmower. It actually creates your lawn. It uses a camera. It uses touch to know what to go around, what to avoid, like a pet, for example. It has a neural network embedded in it. This is one of the ones that I got a demo of. This is called the Electric Sheep. And this particular company's business model today is not to sell the lawnmower, but to uh, do a lawnmower s uh, as a service, basically, keeping care of your lawn as a service and using this as their competitive advantage as you move forward. There are so many examples here. I was actually, I had to add this in very fast. I don't know if you guys saw this little dude going down the road, but I followed it. Uh, it was here in Austin, and it must be multimodal because I watched how it was going around things and sensing things. There were no wires to guide it. Um, it would bump into something with a touch and figure out what to do going around that or, or stopping or how it proceeded forward. So it's everywhere. If you look for it, this is everywhere. Now, why, why am I so excited about this? Well. So my past role is I was the um, vice president for Amazon Web Services. And at Amazon, we do everything in flywheels. So you're gonna see a couple of flywheels here. So think about this. Now, if you start at the bottom left-hand side of this slide, you'll see more data really kicks off our flywheel effect. But now we've got, if you got this uh, you know, usage that generates more data, now you've got more types of data as well coming in. Voice, sound, touch, sight, which gives you better models, which gets you better analytics, which gets you more usage, and the flywheel just starts going and going and going. So this, I think, will be a phenomenal trend that you're going to see come, uh, come to real fruition by the next South by Southwest. So what's your action here? What's your homework here? Well, you need to start thinking multimodal. I was just in a strategic brainstorming session this last week. They were only thinking text. You've got to th start thinking multimodal. How will this enhance your decision making? If now you're not just using text, you can use video, you can use picture, you can use sound. How does that change the game? How does that drive innovation for my business? How does that help me create a competitive advantage? So this is our trend number two. You guys all still with me? Yes. Okay, okay, awesome. So now let's go on to trend number three. So remember we talked about exponential baby, now multimodal. Our trend number three is around experiences. This experiential age has started and even started with virtual beings. Now I really wanted to call this one um, the holodeck, but I was explaining it to my daughters and they didn't know what the holodeck was. But I am a Star Trekkie. Do you guys remember the holodeck? You could make up anything and go into it. That's, what we're, that's the age we're entering into. And in fact, in the holodeck, you actually saw virtual beings, right? Well, that is where we are today. We see the same types of things. And in fact, let's see, I want this uh, volume low if you could. This is from the Apple Vision Pro go into a store and you can actually get a demo. And this is what, so this is Alicia Keys. So I, no matter where I am, if I'm in my living room, I am now in her rehearsal studio with her. I can walk around the piano. I can be there with her backup singers. I'm actually part of what's going on now. No longer am I sitting in my living room. Now I'm experiencing something on all sides of me. It's a whole different experience that's coming through. It's a whole different way that we're gonna see things. Oops, let's see, there you go, yeah. Whole different way that we're gonna experience things. Now, it's not just with the Apple Vision Pro either. 
Um, this is an, exper an immersive experience inside of an art gallery. Now, I went in this art gallery, you do put on glasses, so you do have that spatial viewpoint again. But in this gallery, as you go through and as you're walking around, you can touch things. Like, I can never touch things in the New York Museum of Art. I can touch, I can feel. They have smells, so as I'm looking at paintings, I can smell what's going on. These immersive experiences are happening today, and in fact, I would say we now have the internet of senses. We're now experiencing through the internet our touch, our sight, our smell, our images, everything we're experiencing. And what's gonna happen to the world? Well, the world is gonna completely change. Um, it's gonna be spatial, it's gonna be seamless. So if you look at this road map, some of you remember back to IBM where we had the mainframe. Then we went to the PC, right? Everybody was on a laptop. And then we went to mobile device. Like, can you walk, like today, I've almost run into like 10 people because they've got their head down on their mobile device. What's that gonna look like in the future? Maybe next year at South by Southwest, everybody's gonna be wearing a spatial device on their head. And in fact, I was flying here and this was one of the guys on the plane with me. He's wearing his Apple Vision Pro on the plane, looking at multiple screens, touching things. Is this our new reality? Looking forward. Now remember that holodeck. That holodeck also had virtual human beings on it too, right? So let's think about the most used AI applications today. Many would think that it is ChatGPT, but they would be wrong. The most used AI applications today are AI companions. Now why is this? This is kind of sad, but I looked up some of the data and it says that loneliness has increased 40% since COVID. People are lonely, singles, the elderly. And so one of the hot new trends that I got to play with at CES as well was a di digital companion. Um, this was like a robot. It could sit at a table with me and have dinner. It could have an interesting conversation with me over a glass of tea like I did at CES. I can put any face on it so I could change my companion every day if I wanted to have dinner with a different person. This is one of the hottest new areas that we're seeing right now in AI, and it is by far the most used AI application that's out there. So what do you need to do here? Well, you need to figure out how you embed many of these immersive experiences in what you're already doing. And I would say, how many of you have gone to the Apple store and gotten the Apple Pro Vision demo? Okay, not enough of you. Go and get the demo. You'll be in the midst of dinosaurs running or Alicia Keys. It's really cool. They aren't the only spatial glasses out there, but they actually have stores so you can go and experience it without laying out $3,600 for um, the Vision Pro yourself. So you can feel it. I, I still think there's a long way to go on the glasses. They're still a little bit heavy, at least for me, but it's a great experience. Now let me just show you one company who started where they were today, um, and this is Pudgy Penguins. I don't know if you guys know Pudgy Penguins. Anybody bought a Pudgy Penguin? So this is a Pudgy Penguin. So they actually started out <clears throat> digitally with people who love their brand as an NFT, and then they created these plushy animals. But they're watching this world change. They're seeing how the world is changing out there. And so what they've done is on each of these plushies, they have a tag and they have a birth certificate, and you can scan that and go into their immersive world. Their future roadmap even has on it the support of the Apple Pro Vision glasses as they move forward. What are they trying to do? They're working on that customer experience flywheel. So they have people who love their brand and who have experiences with them. Today they're, they're more blockchain oriented or a plushie that's right here. But what they're gonna add are things like Apple Vision Pro experiences, an AI world that takes you into almost a holodeck, which will drive their community 
which will drive people to build with them, which will then again drive people to love their brand. So your brand can start wherever you are. You don't have to start being fully AI ready as well. Okay, now let's go on to trend number four. Um, everything is being digital twinned. This is pretty interesting. I'm on a board of a company called Altair, and they're known for doing digital twins. In the last two years, the number of companies executing with a digital twin has gone up exponentially. We see more and more companies doing this. Now, what is it? Well, a digital twin is simply a virtual view of what you have in the physical world. So think about that. You're turning with sensors, something that's real, into a digital version of that as well. Now, where does that exist today? I said it's everywhere. Well, it is everywhere. I'm going to take you back to my teeth. This is a digital twin of my teeth. They digitize my teeth, so now they have a digital twin of it from all the sensors that they used. But it's not just in medicine. Um, this is um, a company that produces hydrogen autonomous trucks. Uh, this is Pedro, one of the guys that I met, and he explained to me how they designed the hydrogen truck. The only way they could test it, do maintenance on it, see what happens when it crashes, is through a digital twin. So they leverage digital twin to do the hydrogen model truck. And what about when you put on that Apple Vision Pro? When you go and you have it on and you're looking at the store, you're actually not looking at the real store. They've created a digital twin of that store because if you block the camera, you can't see it. It's a digital twin of the store. Cities are doing this too, public sector. So this is a city in Sweden. They've created a digital twin of their street using sensors and AI. Now they're able to experiment with traffic volumes or dogs barking to see how they want to set ordinances around noise. And think about that autonomous car, Tesla. Tesla creates a digital twin for every car that it builds. And that's for maintenance, that's for seeing how long the battery life is, but it also creates a digital twin of the street. So this is a car, have you guys seen this car driving around, let me, let me push the button here. This car actually has followed me everywhere. I went to three parties last night, it was at every single party I was at. Uh, it creates a digital twin of the street that it's driving down. And even TVs. I was talking to the guys who created the new transparent TV. Because it was so expensive to create it and experiment, they created a digital twin with sensors, did all the design, having AI do the optimization for that transparent TV. I think this is a, an interesting trend as we go forward, and it's really, I think, important for you guys to look at your company and see by function what could be digital twinned. Where would that value be? Now, I did show you here a process because it was hard for me to take a picture of a digital twin of a, let's say, a marketing process. Um, but just two weeks ago, I was with a company who did a digital twin of their marketing process. And what they could then do is change elements of their lead gen or their performance management to see what those changes would invoke on their bottom line. Even looking at things like how they would change education. You don't want to educate your whole uh, customer base without an impact. So now you could simulate that through a digital twin. So this is our trend number four. So we've got three more to go, and then I've got some lessons for you. You guys all still with me? Okay, awesome. So hang in there with me. So we got trend number five, which is tokenization of everything. And I find this really fascinating. Um, I went to Davos, the World Economic Forum. This was one of the top topics discussed, not just by companies, but also by world leaders. So first of all, let's talk about what is it. So a digital uh, a token, tokenization is just taking the rights to an asset. So let's just say I've got this plushie here. And I now want to put the ownership of this on blockchain. 
So then I have a digital ownership record for something that is physical. Now this is quite interesting. So I actually participated in a space session. Space will impact us too in the future, by the way. So space, they're looking at debris. You know, we have all this trash now circulating, circulating, circulating. They want to get rid of the trash, but when that space debris comes down, it has a lot of value to it. And so what they're looking at now doing with NASA is giving each of those pieces of space debris an ownership through a token which sits on the blockchain. It's quite fascinating because now they know who's responsible for bringing the trash down, but also when that debris comes down, they know the owner of it, and so that really valuable material now belongs to somebody too. I know space is a little out there, so now let's, let me take a look at something that may be closer to your hearts, which is your clothing. So I was just with a, um, a startup. They're based in Japan. And one of the trends there is that for baby clothes, people like to buy Burberry baby clothes when, they're, when they have a newborn. But guess what happens? Your baby grows really fast. And so the, you outgrow the clothes. So there is a huge secondary market for Burberry clothes in Japan for babies. But how do they tell when you're buying it? How do you know what the authenticity is? How do I know that that onesie that's a Burberry onesie is actually real. So what they've started to do is they tokenize in the item so that it has the ownership, the authenticity that this is a real good. They're placing that on the blockchain. Second one, I was talking to three retailers who are now asking anybody who sells in their store that claims their, their jacket, let's say my jacket said it was sustainable. So if you're going to claim it something is sustainable, using sustainable methods, you now are going to have a token so that you can go look digitally at the whole history of this item. I could go back to the, I don't know, I guess it's cotton, go back to the cotton all the way forward and see the history of sustainability to make sure every element, not just growing the cotton, but who made it, who put it together, how it was delivered, is all following the sustainability trends. But it's not just clothing. I was down in Tampa, and do you know we've had our first house that was sold, and the ownership, the owner's title, is a token. The deed sits on the blockchain. So that's how that ownership of that house is being done. She now has so many requests for this. <clears throat> she's heading out to Lisbon, she's going to Europe, she's going to Asia. Everybody now wants to digitize the deed for their house. On the right-hand side, one of the things she told me that was really fascinating was how the ease of use happened. If you've ever bought a house, have any of, anybody ever bought a house out there? You're signing, what, a gazillion papers, right? Now, you eliminated all of that, and you had one thing to sign with your digital signature that said you agreed to everything. So I think this is really fascinating. Now, where do you store that? Well, that's another big trend, which is a digital identity. You now can store those tokens in your digital account. It's almost like a LinkedIn version three for you, <coughs> but it has everything in there. So for example, you can see an apartment, maybe my um, rental agreement for New York is in here. My car title for my BMW. California is already doing this, by the way. They're using and putting this on a blockchain called Tezos today, and you can find your car title tokenized. Uh, or even my ticket for South by Southwest that I came to. You know, maybe I want to prove that I was here. I'll tell you an interesting story. So in Phoenix, we had the Super Bowl, not this year, but last year. I was talking to the guys from the NFL because they created a token ticket so that you would have the ticket, the physical item, you would show your digital ownership. Do you know why they did that? Because the, no Instagram is good, but because they looked at social media and they analyzed the football, the, the Super Bowl the year before, if everybody who tweeted, I went to the Super Bowl, actually went, the stadium would have been five times as large as it was. So now you have proof that you were at the, at the, uh, at the event. So what do you, what's your action here? Your homework here is 
what can your brand tokenize? And is there value for that? So for example, can you track your product from cradle to grave? And if you could, what would change about it? What could you change? What could you articulate in a very, very different fashion? I think this one is gonna be really interesting. And in fact, I attended probably 18 or 19 sessions at the World Economic Forum of this, in particular because it affects governments. Imagine tokenizing a satellite where small countries can't get access to that, to tokenizing all of these things we've talked about, clothing, real estate, even LLM. So someone has now tokenized a large language learning model. And why did they do that? Because they said that people were stealing their ideas. So now they've tokenized it, so they have a digital ownership record, so they can track everyone who uses it, so now they can get paid part of their business model. I just find this one fascinating. Okay, let's go on to trend number six. Um, we talked about this last year at South By, I heard some of it, but now tech convergence is finally here. You know, we always pay attention to the noise, to the hype, what's going on in the market. But what if instead of just paying attention to the hype, that you looked at all of the things that you need to create value for your business? So I just wanted to show you a couple of things that I think are important. Uh, because it really does matter to your business and what you're doing because it can help you streamline your processes. Sometimes it's not just going to be AI alone. Sometimes it's going to need to be AI plus spatial, AI plus blockchain, AI plus quantum eventually. So you're going to need to look at the full tech convergence that's happening. Create new markets for yourself, new customers, and you can be at the forefront of industry. If you look at most of the leaders in the space, they're not just using AI, they're using AI and something else. So let me show you a couple of examples. We just talked about tokenization, and tokenization is really putting things on the blockchain. Now imagine if you have the blockchain with artificial intelligence, could you do more? You, you absolutely could. These things overlap, and there are things that AI lacks like data ownership, transparency, monetization, that blockchain can bring to the table. So sometimes you're not just gonna use AI, you're gonna use AI plus. So I'm trying to get to all the industries. So this is my financial services one that I think is really cool. This is a company called FactNet. So FactNet has assets, they've digitized their assets, so they've tokenized them, they sit on the blockchain, and now what they're doing is they're using AI to come in and evaluate any ideas of fraud or protecting, looking at anything else that could be happening in that equation. We also just talked about this digital identity, right? We talked about having you know, all these things on your digital identity. But what if, in addition to this digital identity where your, where your car is and your apartment is, that's all on the blockchain, what if, in addition, you could do AI recommendations off of that digital identity? So let's say it sees that I bought a BMW. Maybe there is a BMW fan club in my area. Or it sees that I went to South by Southwest. So it recommends education on technology or music or whatever I went to there. And in addition, because what you've got here um, is You've got AI doing all of these different recommendations that are out there for you, recommending new education, new events, that sort of thing. Now you can bring and optimize the data because in blockchain, you own your own data. Um, without blockchain, companies, entities, countries own your data. So what if now AI could optimize all of that data that you own and you could have passive income coming in on your data. For example, I'm working with a retailer today who instead of paying Meta and Google money for your data, they want to go directly to you if you have your data on blockchain and pay you for that data. You could monetize that. So now we've got AI optimizing the dollars you can make on that data. So let's look at another tech convergence that we're seeing out there, and this is artificial intelligence and AI sensor data. 
So remember the jacket, the mood jacket that we talked about. Just having the mood jacket come in from those sensors without analyzing it doesn't have much value. But if now you can use that data to feed your learning models, now you've got real power. So a great example of this is Amazon Web Services and the NFL. They now have sensors all in the helmets and the pads and the shoes so they can analyze players. And they've done this with 32 clubs. They collect 500 million data points for each athlete, individual data that comes in. This is another trend, individual data. And they use this now to prevent injury and prevent training, you know, have your training regimen all designed together. Think about learning. I have two daughters who learn very differently. What if now I can have sensor data, and I just got a demo of this, I, I couldn't get it in the presentation in time, but it actually looks at your face when you're learning. And if you're making, you know, cringing, you don't say you don't understand, but you can sense it in your face, you can see it in facial recognition to stop and re-go over something again. So using AI plus that data coming in from IoT sensors is another really powerful convergence that's happening out there. And then finally, quantum. Now I know quantum's not here today, but I was able to get a couple of demos of quantum and alpha beta mode with artificial intelligence. <clears throat> it can speed up greatly because quantum gives you more power, more speed. It speeds up the training of your learning model. Imagine that. Now your computer can actually learn so much faster, help the environment because it's learning so much faster. There are also risks here, though. I saw AI plus quantum break down a lot of our cryptography that's out there. So down there are whole companies, whole industries building up around security if quantum, when quantum becomes a reality, because what are we gonna do with all that crypto cryptography out there? So these are just some of the questions you need to ask. I just wanted to do this little teaser with you because I want you to ask questions about all of the technology. Many times people will call me and they'll say, Sandy, I gotta do something in AI. And I'm like, okay, why AI? What problem are you trying to solve? And usually when you go into the problem you're trying to solve, it requires more than just one of those technologies. And remember we talked about exponential baby. All of these trends are happening at the, at the same time. Blockchain and sensors and quantum are all coming together at the same time as well. Okay, are you guys ready for the last trend? This is one of, I think, one of my most interesting ones because the, the next trend is that AI has brought us a lot of new problems too, right? As you would expect from any new technology. And you have to acknowledge that, and then you also have to deal with those too. So I'm gonna just take a look at some of those problems. So one is trust, we're gonna talk about that. Hallucinations, lack of data, jobs and bias. These are all things as leaders we need to look at while we're executing in this space. So let's start first with trust. So this is the Edelman Trust Barometer. I look at this every year. They have such great data. This is for 2024. And let me just explain the chart. On the left, you'll see in the white and the gray, that's I reject this technology. On the right-hand side, I embrace this innovation, what's happening here. So these are people's views from all over the world. So let's start with the first line. If you look at green energy, you see green energy has now crossed that chasm, and people say, we're enthusiastic, we want green energy. If you look at the very bottom, GMO, genetically modified food, for example, you can see the answer is very clear. People are like, no, we don't want this technology. I don't want it. Um, we don't want this technology. But look in the middle. AI is there. It's really borderline, right? You can see 35% reject, 30% accept. And then the same thing is true with gene therapy, which uses AI. Its application is AI-oriented right on the crossroads of this trust factor that's out there. And so it's all of our responsibility to help ensure the trust element. We'll talk about that as leaders too. 
But as we look at this, this is really set in another context. Um, did you know that 49% of the world's population will go through an election this year? This year, 49%, 64 countries plus the EU, I think it's about 70 different regions. What is the number one thing that they survey that people all over this are worried about? Trust, is that really the candidate on the video? There's so many deep fakes. Did he or she really say that? Is that really their quote? Is that really what was happening? So again, here, we started to do some work on this. This is trust verification. This is using blockchain. Remember, blockchain can tell ownership and you sign your signature. So this is an example of a press release when I left Amazon to come over to our startup. Um, you can see there's a blue check mark there verifying my quote, I said this, that's signed on the chain. Now the interesting thing about this is this technology exists today. Um, we actually have a patent on this. The adoption is actually not in the technology. The adoption hang up right now is the business model. So whose responsibility is it to pay for it? So is it the news agency, the person who's publishing the article or the TV who's got the video? They don't wanna pay for it. Is it the company that needs to pay for it? Because they wanna make sure their executives are quoted correctly. They don't wanna pay for it. Is it the individual, like myself? I would love to have that blue check mark there, but can I afford to pay for it? So now we're thinking technology is there, how do we get across the chasm for the business model. I'll show you another funny example. Did you guys see the Pope in his uh, puffer jacket? Four million people retweeted that puffer jacket. It's actually a branded jacket, it's a Ballman jacket, so Ballman was really excited, was gonna do marketing campaigns about it. When it came out that this is actually a deep fake. It's not a real picture of him. But it looks like a real picture, right? On the right-hand side, that's me. Of course, I didn't get four million hits on my picture, but I was at a red, a red carpet event. It was cold, and so the only thing I had was a puffer jacket. After it came out that the Pope picture was fake, people started asking me, was my picture real? Truly. So I have that pink check mark there that shows that I validated that on chain. Now let's go to another problem, hallucinations. So my daughters are taking a prompting class. That's right, I was looking, high schoolers now are taking prompting. And as we were going through the class, she had to do some research for a, uh, for a paper she was writing. Do you know that five of the sources, she was trying to prove a thesis, five of the sources that came back, I said we have to check these out, three of the books it mentioned did not exist. And AI came back, the chat GPT came back and gave me a book title, when the book was published, a page number, and a quote from it from a book that never existed. So you have to double check everything that's out there right now. Hallucinations will eventually go away, of course, but right now, as a leader, you have to check and double check some of these things. You cannot just assume everything today is right. Now let's talk about lack of data. You know, data feeds everything. I was gonna have a trend on data, but as I looked at the seven trends, data underpins all seven of the trends. So data, um, if you don't have enough data, what happens to your learning model? It's only gonna kick out insight on the data that you have. So this is a really vivid example, women's health. Many thanks to McKinsey for producing a report on this specific example. So it wasn't until 1993 in the US that we were mandated to include men and women in clinical research, 1993. That means we have a 17 year gap of data. Well, does that matter? It does because now we've got all of these new AI medical tools coming out, state of the art, amazing, that are working really great for the guys out there. So for example, this is one, it's a liver disease prediction tool just from blood work, it can detect liver cancer. Do you have a liver disease or will you have one? It's amazing. In 77% of the cases, it works really well. But for women, it fails in 44% of the cases. Why? There's not enough data there to support it. So there's all kinds of efforts to support 
getting more data. Now, why is this important? Well, if you have an LLM, it is your responsibility to either tag and say, I didn't have enough data, or all my data was from one animal, or all my data was from one type, because if you don't, your results could be wrong. And let me give you an, a, an interesting one that just happened. Did anybody see Air Canada? Air Canada wanted to be very aggressive on artificial intelligence. And so they started with a chat GPT to help with customer service. A guy went out there and he asked about a bereavement airfare. It gave him the wrong data. It said it was going to refund part of his ticket. Well, Air Canada came out and said, no, that was, that's wrong. But we didn't do that. AI did that. It's not our problem. It's the AI's problem. Well, who trained the AI? Who had the data that trained the AI? Um, and so the judge actually, in the lawsuit, the guy actually brought it forward. <clears throat> it was not for a large amount of money. He wanted to make a point that they said that AI, uh, that um, Air Canada did not take responsibility for the data. So if you think back, I know you guys have seen all kinds of architecture pictures about all the elements of AI. Um, I just want to remind you that at the very bottom, that everything sits on, whether it's the infrastructure, the algorithms, the applications, the governance, the security, the monitoring, the education, everything comes back to the data. So you've got to make sure that your data is right and secure. So your action here, your homework here, is to develop a responsible AI framework. Now I'm going to flash one up. I know it's very busy. We could do a whole session on just responsible AI. Um, but I will post this so you'll see, you know, you need to think about ethics with your AI, your data. Uh, are you going to warn people if you don't have enough data or if you're synthesizing data? Um, how are you going to handle public perception? You know, what are you going to do in that particular case? So there's a whole session we could do here. But now we've got about seven minutes left. What I'm going to do is take you back to the very beginning, where we had those three takeaways. Remember those? Um, you want to be an AI-first thinker. Your business will be disrupted from multiple different areas. Hopefully, you've seen that now. And you need to start resisting and stop, start learning. So let me tell you how you can do that. <clears throat> so one, to be an AI-first thinker, one of the things you need to do is you need to experiment. You saw lots of experiments that I showed you today, right? Um, from the plushie to tons of experiments. This is one that I thought was really fascinating. Um, one of my colleagues, David Armano, he works for a company that's based here called Ringer Sciences. And uh, what they did is they created to experiment an LLM for South by Southwest. And they wanted it just to answer one question as they experimented. What would be one session that you cannot miss at South by Southwest? They did this for Elon Musk, and they actually did this for me. You see it said to come to my session, so that's why I'm here today. If it hadn't recommended that, I wouldn't be here. But this is a great experiment. Experiment with things like that, and then make sure that you're asking questions. So if you think about it, as a leader, if you're an AI first thinker, things are changing. Remember, exponential, baby. They're changing so fast. There's no way you can have all the right answers. But what you want to do is you want to be able to have the right questions. I love this quote. Anyone who knows me knows that I use a lot of quotes. But it says, an expert is not someone who gives all the right answers. An expert is the one she ask all the right questions. And that's what you need to do as an AI first leader. Now, the, the most asked question I get is with all these things changing exponentially, baby, how do I keep up? How do I plan? Like, what is it that I do? Well, my advice here is that first principles still work. You remember first principles, you have a big problem, you break it down into smaller problems to address it, and you stay focused on your problem. You know, you still have to drive revenue, right? You can't just go chase the AI shiny object. You've got to focus on your business, too. I love this quote. This is from one of the partners at Sequoia. And he said, the $200 billion question is, basically, how are you going to use all this infrastructure? And how is it going to change people's lives? So don't do it just to do it. Do it because you're trying to change someone's life. Do it because it's going to have an impact. 
And so the way I advise people to plan, um, and this is a great chart from my, my colleague Ray Wang, who's the CEO of Constellation, is look for the return on your transformational impact. So maybe, you know, you don't want to go out like Air Canada did and first try something with brand transformation. Maybe that's not your first AI experiment out there in the world. Maybe you want to try operational efficiency. If you look at the x-axis, it's level of complexity, and then the y-axis is the risk that's there. So I often will tell people, let's try experiments where there's not a lot of complexity and there's not a lot of risk. Of course, there's more, the more risk, the more reward, but let's play with it, let's learn it, and then we can figure out how to go into some bigger areas of change. Does that make sense for you guys? Because I think this is so important. Again, this is the number one question I get. How do I plan when everything's moving so fast? Don't take your eyes off your ball, which is your revenue and your profit and what you have to deliver, but make sure that you're not ignoring everything that's changing around you. So now the last one, stop, re stop resisting and start learning. So what should you do here? Well, I have a leadership checklist. I just did a few points because I knew this was going to be a large room. But essentially, are you ready as a leader? Now, and don't look to the side if you're not the manager. Every single one of you in this room is a leader. First of all, you're here learning. Hopefully, you're going to go back and share this information with your colleagues. Um, but some of the things you need to check with. One, do you know when to trust an AI agent? I showed you the, I talked about the hallucination my daughter got. You will get that in business too. Um, and so you need to ask the right questions. Number two, you need to make sure that you value human insight. One of the things that people are so afraid of is if you start talking AI, the first thing they think is, my job's going away. So how do you also showcase that you're going to try some things, but you're going to value that human insight as well? Make sure you're investing in training for your full team. I don't know if you saw Accenture, uh, Julie Sweet, who's the CEO there, just bought an AI learning company. Why? Because she knows she has to train her entire Accenture team and all of her customers on this as well. So make sure you're not just training some of the team. One of the biggest insights, I was just at a CEO, um, 500 CEOs talking about AI, and they said this was their biggest learning. They can't just train one team on AI. They really need to be looking at their whole company. And then finally, focus, focus, focus. Focus on your KPIs. Focus on your use case. Focus on your value. I can't tell you how many times people call me and they say, I got to do something with AI. I got to do something with AI. I got to do something with AI. And it is growing exponentially, baby, but you've got to stay focused on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to solve, what your KPIs are at the same time. Now, you also have to get your teams ready. And I think this, um, I did research with about 400 different companies. And I found that teams that have what we call rabbit teams that are very dynamic and very fluid were the ones that adopt to all of this exponential change that's going on. And in fact, uh, I put all that information into a book. Uh, it's called The Tiger and the Rabbit. And uh, this book really addresses why tiger teams or the old structures aren't going to work in the new world with all these exponential changes happening. Because here you have to break through silos. You've got to be different. You've got to think differently. And so uh, this is the back of the book. One of my favorite things was um, I love and admire Pepsi. Pepsi read the book and really thought about rabbit teams and how they needed to rework. And uh, Pepsi actually said they changed their concept of teams and changed the name to the rabbit team because of this concept of everything happening exponentially. OK, so we are at the close time. Was this valuable for you guys? So let me just flash up those seven trends again so that you guys can see them and take those away. Um, so make sure that you're looking at all these as you're being that AI first leader as you're looking at how your business will be disruptive from multiple angles and how you're going to continue to learn. Stop resisting and start to learn. 
Um, I'd love to meet with any of you. You guys can reach out to me at any time. Today, I have a book signing at 210. Um, it's in room 10C as well. I'd love to meet as many as, of you as I could. If I can help you in any way, um, I'm available on Twitter and Signal and WhatsApp and Telegram. Uh, for the most part, it's Sandy Carter. On Twitter, it's Sandy underscore Carter, which I did put at the bottom of everything that I did. And then I do want to do a call out too. Um, I did use many different AI tools to create this, but I did have an agency help me, which was Lakowski Creative as well. So thank you guys so much for today. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of your South by Southwest. Thank you.